Amen. 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 Sweet Holy Spirit. Isn't he sweet? Amen. He's awesome, isn't he? Amen. So as you know, today's been a very special time, special day for my wife and I and our family here as a church. And we just finished dedicating our son to God. Be the glory. Be the glory. Amen. Of course, you know, we already did that from conception, right? But today we did that and expressed it amongst our family, friends, and all heaven, right? Publicly, right? Just like God did with Abraham that time, right? So this event is a significant one. Do you agree with that? Yes. yes. For it is a memorial in reality. And we're going to look at that a little bit. I'll just tell you the title of the presentation today before we pray. It's going to be Jesus presented at the temple. Because this ceremony that we just witnessed is actually a memorial of the Lord's wonderful deliverance of the children of Israel, which actually even that prefigured a greater deliverance to be wrought out by the only begotten Son of God. So we're going to delve in that today a little bit and ask God to teach us the deeper lessons regarding the ceremony which we all have just witnessed today. Are you with me? Amen? Amen. You okay with that? Amen. So let's pray. Dear loving Father, I just want to thank you once again for just all of the many blessings that you've blessed each and every one of us with. Even as you have blessed me and my wife with Azriel. And as we, we know that he belongs to you, we know that each and every one of us belong to you as well. And so, dear Father, we come before you asking you, Lord, to take charge of our minds right now. Taking charge of this next service. We pray, dear God, that you would send your sweet, sweet spirit, that he may be among us and your holy angels as we open up your word. We pray, Lord, that you teach us the deep significance of even the ceremony that we just witnessed today. That we may leave this place today with a little bit more understanding and a, and a deeper appreciation of these type of ceremonies. And that, Lord, it would really just touch our hearts. That our hearts would melt even further, even more than, the, than they've already melted. So that, as we heard earlier, you can write your principles of agape love in our hearts. And that our stony hearts will become hearts of flesh. So dear Father, we thank you and we praise you. Use me as your mouthpiece. Empty me of self and every one of us so that we can receive what you have for us today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to start out. Uh, Pablo, can you spotlight yourself? What's that? Spotlight myself. I'm not the host, but I'll tell Elder Ken. He's going to do it now. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that uh, reminder, Sister Andrea. So we're going to start by going back in time. You know, we usually go back in time when we're talking about historical things, right? We're going to go back 2,025 years. Is that all right? You ready for a little time Time travel. <laughs> We're going to go to the year BC4. Anybody know what happened in BC4? Yes. Christ was born. BC4. You'll say, wait a minute, but didn't he live? Wasn't, he, uh, wasn't it uh, AD 27 when he was 30? How could it be BC4? Because zero doesn't get counted. So you go from one to one. So if you go four, three, two, one, you go from four to three, that's one. Three to two, that's one. Two to one is one, that's three years before zero. And then the 27 above, that's 30 years, right? So he was born in BC4. So that's what happened 2,025 years ago today. And it, it was at that time that Jesus came into the world. And it was at that time that... Um, 
Also, during that same year, Mary's days of purification had ended, and her and her husband were now traveling from Bethlehem to Jerusalem in that same very year for a most solemn occasion. And we start off in the book Luke. We're going to go to Luke chapter 2, and we're going to start off there today. We're looking at the time when Christ was born, then shortly after that, the days of the purification of his mother Mary was accomplished, and they began to travel from Bethlehem, where he was born, down to Jerusalem, where they were going to also uh, go into a most solemn ceremony and occasion. So Luke chapter 2, verse 22, it begins. Luke chapter 2, and verse 22. And we're going to stay in there a little bit, so if you want to keep follow along a little bit, we're going to be kind of staying in Luke chapter 2, probably through the... I'm going to be switching around to other things, but I'll be coming back to Luke chapter 2, so if you want to stay there, you can, as we continue. So, and when the days of her purification, talking about Mary, this was after he was born, right? There was a time of purification, which we're going to look at a little bit. When those days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him, Christ, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Verse 23 says, And as it was, it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to, verse 24, And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So, we understand that, by the way, you know, here we see that it says, every male that opened up the womb. So it seems like there was a bias there or there was a, a gender issue. But no, we understand that every person, whether male or female, are to be offered as holy, means entirely, to the Lord. You agree with that? Whether male or female. Yes. Amen. And although the verse just read doesn't mention this, it was clearly instituted by God and recorded in Leviticus chapter 12, Verses 5 to 8, if you want to refer to that later, where it talks about the female. When she was born, she was also to be brought before the Lord and dedicated. All right, so that was Leviticus 12, verses 5 to 8. So whether a pair gave birth to a male or a female, that child was to be offered unto the Lord at a particular time. And the parents were required to bring the very same offering, by the way, which was a burnt offering and a sin offering. A burnt offering, which in reality signified a complete surrender and dedication to the Lord. And a sin offering, which signified true heart repentance for any sins that have ever been committed. Are you with me? Amen. A burnt offering and a sin offering was to be offered to the Lord. So I wonder if Mary and Joseph actually understood the significance of of the offerings that they were instructed to bring to the temple, for they are also, they also have a very deep, deep and profound meaning, by the way. Everything in the ceremony, every ceremony that we see instituted by God has had deep, serious, profound meaning. In Desire of Ages, page 50, paragraph 3, we are told that the offerings presented to the Lord were to be without blemish. And this is talking about specifically here, every offering, of course, was without blemish, right? But we're talking about this ceremony here. Notice, these offerings, we're told in Desire of Ages, represented Christ. And from this, you know, because it says without blemish, it is evident that Jesus himself was free from physical deformity. Amen? He was perfect, wasn't he? In 1 Peter 1.19, he was the lamb without blemish and without spot. His physical structure was not marred by any defect. His body was strong and healthy. I praise God because they said that about my son when he was born. You know that? He doesn't even have a, a birthmark. He's perfect. I said, wow, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. His physical structure was not marred by any defect. His body was strong and healthy. And they kept... And they kept uh, Talking about his heart, they're like, it's so strong. They kept checking it like every five, I don't know, it's like every two minutes almost. They were like, man, this is he's strong. But throughout his lifetime, Christ lived in conformity to nature's laws, 
physically as well as spiritually. He was an example of what God designed all humanity to be through obedience to his laws. We were talking about earlier, obedience to laws, right? We can be obedient to certain laws, but our heart might not be in it. And that makes, the law, makes our actions of obedience really null and void. Because the motive should be what? Appreciation and love to God. Amen? And then it would be true. True evidence of faith. The laws given to regulate the time after birthing a child were no arbitrary laws given by Moses. They culminated in a special ceremony given by God. It was very significant to all generations, by the way. Even today, we just experienced it today, right? But we probably don't even understand the deep significance of it. But we're going to look at it today. And we know that there's some deep significance in regard to we offer it to the Lord and everything and all that's good. But it goes even deeper than that. So these special, this special ceremony is very significant to all generations, and especially the children of Israel that were living at that time. Moses was just a mouthpiece for God, wasn't he? Notice here in uh, Leviticus 12, verses 1 to 4, going on to some of the things that were mentioned about the time that the woman had to wait after she gave birth. Notice, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed and born a, ma a man child, remember, it goes on in verses 5 to 8 to talk about the female child. So this is not gender bias, okay? It, it it's applies to both, but we're focusing on the male child here because there's a point for that as we go into the study, okay? So I just want to make that clear. So let's, go, let's read on. If a woman have conceived seed and born a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days. The only difference between the male and the female is that she was said to be unclean double the amount of time, and the period of, of her purification was double the amount of time. So for the man-child, it, it was seven days of uncleanness, and then another 33 days to, for her you know, to, to be cleansed or whatever. And then the female was 14 days, and then another 66 days days of her period of purification. So, notice here, if a woman have conceived seed and born a man child, then she shall be unclean seven days according to the days of the separation for her infirmity shall she be unclean. This doesn't mean she was unclean like in a sinful way. This is a physical uncleanness. It just means that she needs to heal. There's some things that need to be, you know what I mean? But we're going to see some significance to it. And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin, the child, shall be circumcised. And she shall then continue in the blood of her purification three and thirty days. She shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. Now, all of this time away from the sanctuary, away from you know a lot of people and everything, in reality, it had benefits. It had benefits for her, for the child, but it also had some seriously deep, significant spiritual uh, significance. So look at, I'm going to read a quotation from a, from a, a guy that I kind of quote kind of often. His name is Matthew Henry. He said this, This ceremonial unclean, uh, uncleanness, which the law laid, the law laid women in child bed under, was to signify the pollution of, of sin, which we are all conceived and born in. So there was also a spiritual significance to it. Not to say she would, it was sinful for her to have a child. That's not what it said. Okay, we'll see what it means. Notice in Psalm 51.5, it says, Behold, I was shaped in what? Iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. So did you have a point? He has a point. There's a spiritual significance to what that waiting was all about. Now, he also continues to say, he says, For if the root be impure, so is the branch. Right? So if when Adam sinned, he had a child. If Adam was polluted by sin, so was the child. If the root be impure, so is the branch. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Think about that. That means we're all born unclean. If sin had not entered, nothing but purity and honor 
would have attended all the productions of that great blessing, which we're told in, in Genesis, where it says, be fruitful and multiply. But now that the nature of man is degenerated, the propagation of that nature is laid under these marks of disgrace. In other words, there's pain and childbearing. There's blood. There's a lot of things there that probably wouldn't be there if we would have never sinned. The birthing process involves blood, doesn't it? Yes, mothers out there? Birthing process, does it involve blood? Absolutely. And why does it involve blood? Because of sin, isn't it? Maybe if we would have never sinned, maybe there wouldn't be no blood. Maybe that everything would expand so nice and naturally and the baby would just come out without any pain. Didn't pain come after sin? Didn't God say, because of sin, now you will give labor in pain? So before sin, there wouldn't be no pain. Wouldn't have no labor pains, really. Or maybe you'd have some kind of notifications, you know, but, but it wouldn't be the way it is today. So it is because of sin that the birthing process is the way it is today. It is a very painful thing for many, many mothers, and some mothers might go through more pain than others. For most mothers, the healing process can be rather lengthy, depending on what type of process you have to go through to give birth, whether it's C-section or whatever. They say C-section is like eight weeks of healing. Natural birth, they say it's about four weeks. Depending on what happens, the healing process can vary. God appointed a minimum period of 40 days. And you know what I want to say? For the recovery of the mother. He's so gentle and so kind. You know, mothers could have been taxed a lot back then. Because remember, they were the housewife. They might have been the one doing a lot of work in the house. Maybe husbands would have been thinking, well, you just had a baby, but you could still do it. No, God said, no, you need to give them 40 days. They're the female, 80 days. God appointed a minimum of 40 days for the recovery of the mother. This was a time for her to heal and to bond with her new baby. Amen? You know, you even think about when a husband and wife used to get married. They would have a whole year. Right? They say, you don't work for a year. Spend time with your wife for a year. Bond and connect. God believes in relationships. And he always makes provisions for that. For the development of and nurturing of relationships. Amen? Amen? Sin is the cause of the discombobulation of families and systems. Sin is the cause of the pain and blood that a mother feels when a child is born. Sin was the cause of the pain and blood felt by the Godhead when the father and son experienced the second death separation. At Calvary, remember that? And who do you do that? Who do you do that for? For you and I. The pain that a mother feels is actually nothing compared to what God felt when he had to be separated from his son at Calvary. Do you agree with that? There's nothing. There's no human pain, no physical pain that can touch it. Although both male and female infants were to be dedicated entirely or wholly to God. The dedication of the firstborn was very special to the Israelite families. And I tell you, I didn't think about this today, but when Elder Ken mentioned it, it hit me. Yes, my son is also a firstborn. He's my fourthborn, but he's also a firstborn. He's a firstborn for my wife, isn't he? Let's read something about the dedication of the firstborns in Desire of Ages, page 51, paragraph 1. It says, The dedication of the firstborn had its origin in the earliest times. God had promised to give the firstborn of heaven to save the sinner. So where does that come from? Eternity past, right? This gift was to be acknowledged in every household by the consecration of the firstborn son. And as I said earlier, both male and females were to be consecrated regardless. But here's there's a significance to the firstborn son. Here. This gift was to be acknowledged in every household, so he was to be devoted to the priesthood. This is why it was so significant. As a representative of Christ among men. Amen? 
You see, brethren, Jesus was the firstborn of heaven, so to speak. And every firstborn in every Jewish household was to be a representative of Christ. Matter of fact, so many of the tribe of Judah, especially, imagine. Imagine every time somebody from the tribe of Judah had a child. They must have been thinking, maybe this is him. Right? Because where did Christ come from? The tribe of Judah. He's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So imagine when a, a Judahite, or whatever you want to call him, had a, had a, had a, was expecting a firstborn son. And they see there was a son that came out. They said, this, must, this might be him. This might be him. So they must have been filled with great anticipation and hope that their child would be the Messiah. Huh? <laughs> but you know, sadly, when the Messiah did come, hardly anyone was anticipating his coming. Isn't that right? Not even the priest that did the dedication ceremony knew, th knew that it was Christ. Not even him. Only a handful of consecrated believers understood it. So we're going to read a quotation. This next quotation describes this fact. Listen here to the con uh, conditions of the very priest that held the Savior in his arms. He had no clue who he was, who he was holding in his arms. Notice here, this is, uh, lift him up, page 29, paragraph 6. Also, the Desire of Ages, page 50 to 52. It says, the priest went through the ceremony of his official work. What was he doing? Dedicating Jesus Christ to the Lord, to the Father. He took the child in his arms. He held him up before the altar. And after handing him back to his, his mother, he, he inscribed the name Jesus on the roll of the firstborn. You know how they got to do a birth certificate, right? Yeah. Today we do birth certificates. Back then they wrote their name in a scroll or whatever. Or in a roll. Little did he think, as the baby lay in his arms, that it was the majesty of heaven, the king of glory. The priest did not think that this babe was the one of whom Moses had written, quote, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Acts 3 and verse 22. He did not think that this babe was he whose glory Moses had asked to see. But one greater than Moses lay in the priest's arms. And when he enrolled the child's name, he was enrolling the name of one who was the foundation of the whole Jewish economy. He didn't know it. How sad. The minds of the people had become so indifferent to the prophecies of old. The priest and most of all Israel didn't even understand the significance not only of the baby dedication ceremony, but of the one of Jesus Christ himself. All they had in their minds was, what, what can I gain today? You know, what, I got to go out here and see what I can, I can, I can make something today. You know, I got to go uh, achieve something today because I got to keep, you know, just trying to get as much as I can. All, just gain of wealth, gain, gain of things. That's all they were thinking about. The laws that uh, that they were given and all these ceremonies that they were given had become meaningless to them. It was like, everything was just like a, a ritual, right? Even the sacrifices were just rituals to them. And they believed that these rituals that like we heard earlier, these things, their law keeping, their sacrifices, their dedications, all these things that they were doing had given them some merit, and attributed holiness to them. They were the holy people of God, weren't they? Because they made sacrifices. Because they dedicated their children. They didn't eat certain types of foods. They dressed a certain type of way, had certain types of haircuts. 
But in reality, reading from uh, inspiration, the law of, for the presentation of the firstborn was a significant one. When the children of Israel were in bondage to the Egyptians, as we heard earlier, the Lord commanded Moses to go to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say, Thus saith the Lord, Israel. Notice here. Now Israel was a nation, wasn't it? Notice what it said, what, he's, what he, the Lord was telling the, uh, Pharaoh. Israel is my son. Yes. Even my firstborn. Yes. And I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. And we know that God didn't slay anyone, right? But he was basically telling him, you're going to lose things that you hold near and dear to yourself because my protection will not cover you if you continue to rebel against the offerings of my grace and mercy. There's another quotation where it says, God wanted to, you know, I'm paraphrasing, God wanted to actually use the Pharaoh. God wanted the Pharaoh to become his son as well. He wanted to use him to, to evangelize all of Egypt. But he refused. The firstborn dedication represents the deliverance of Israel from bondage, brethren. What we just experienced today, one of the significances, one of the meanings of it, one of the things that God wants to remind us of when we're doing a dedication is the deliverance of each Israel from bondage. Are you with me? Think about that. That's what this ceremony, one of the things it represents. As a child is dedicated, he is in essence given back to God, isn't he? He's been delivered to God, isn't he? This is what happened in Egypt. There came a time when Israel, although they were in bondage, were given back to God. He said, he said, Israel is my son, my first begotten son. Right? My. God used Moses as a type of deliverer, didn't he? Yeah. He was like a type of Christ. Notice here again, I think it's manuscript 104, 1900, paragraph 5. It says, Moses delivered his message, but the proud king's answer was, quote, Who is the Lord? that I should obey his voice to let Israel go. I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Exodus chapter 5 verse 2. By signs and wonders, the Lord worked for his people, sending, we know that this is, this is Bible language applies to the spirit of prophecy, you know that. You know he did, wasn't sending, but it's written this way, so we're going to read that way. By signs and wonders, the Lord worked, for his people, sending terrible judgments upon the land of Egypt. And while suffering, Pharaoh would appear to concede to the Lord's demands. But no sooner was he free from the plague, then his stubbornness increased. And again, he set himself in rebellion against the God of heaven. At length, the destroying angel was bidden or permitted to slay the firstborn of man and beast among the Egyptians. And the Israelites were directed to place upon their doorposts, what was it? Blood. What does a woman have to uh, release? Some blood. The Israelites were directed to place upon the doorpost the blood of the slain lamb. Every house was to be marked that when the angel came on his mission of death, he would pass over those homes, the homes of the Israelites. So there was blood involved in that deliverance. Reading on in one, uh, manuscript release 104, 1900, paragraph 6. After sending this judgment or permitting this judgment to fall upon Egypt, the Lord said to Moses something very, very profound. And I highlighted this, so pay close attention to this. The Lord said this to Moses. He said, sanctify unto me the firstborn, both of man and beast. It is mine. 
That's found in Exodus chapter 13, verse 2. It goes on to say, also we're quoting from Numbers chapter 3 and verse 13. On the day that I smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I hallowed unto me all the firstborn in Israel. Mine they shall be, I am the Lord. We're, we're going to continue on one more quote here, and then we'll, we'll comment. This one is uh, 104, 1900, paragraph 7. Therefore the law for the presentation of the firstborn was peculiarly significant, for it was a memorial of the Lord's wonderful deliverance of the children of Israel. That's what the, the significance is here. Which prefigured a greater deliverance to be wrought out by the only begotten Son of God. The blood sprinkled on the doorposts represented the blood of Christ, which alone has power to save the world. So you know what? You see, the Bible tells us that when Christ resurrected from the horrendous death that he received at Calvary, right there, the Bible tells us that he was again begotten. He was begotten into this world, but then when he was crucified and resurrected, it, where the Bible tells us he was again begotten, or so to speak, born again. Are you with me? When he was, when he resurrected, I'm talking about when he resurrected, the Bible says that there was a, there was a type of begotten. He was begotten there. That means there was a type of birth there. Or another type of dedication there. You understand me? In other words, the blood that he shed in victory against the prince of darkness at Calvary gave birth to a new and improved humanity, glorified humanity. Amen. You and I can now have the assurance that we will soon experience the greatest deliverance that this ceremony signifies. Even now, even, you can even apply it to, to the greatest deliverances when we're what? When we're delivered out of this world of darkness to the very presence of God himself. Amen? All of that is wrapped up and embodied in the dedication ceremony. Wow. In Acts chapter 13, verses 32 and 33, the Bible says, And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm. Notice that he's going to quote the second psalms now. When Jesus was what? Raised up. Notice here. God has fulfilled the same unto us, the children, that in that he has raised up Jesus again, as it is written in the second psalm. Thou art my son. This day. What day? The day he was what? Raised up. This day have I begotten thee. You see it? This day. In Acts chapter 13. Verse 38 39 says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Do you know that conversion is actually a reception of the forgiveness of sins? It's accepting the forgiveness. Do you know that? To believe and accept it is conversion. That's it. It is so simple, but yet people make it so complicated. Huh? Yes, it's the same thing. When you believe that Jesus has cleansed and done everything for us to, to make us right with God again, and we accept Him, we receive, we, we actually apply that forgiveness to our experience. You know that? We, we get to experience it, and it brings what? Peace, joy, and happiness. So through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by Him, all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Amen? I like what we were hearing earlier. You cannot, you know, if somebody dies and they give everything to Brother Joel, 
Yeah, you, you've inherited a bunch of stuff, Joel. How can I go and say, no, I can claim it for myself? If the person on their will said, no, it's going to all go to Brother Joel. How can I try to work a scheme to try to gain his inheritance? You can't. There's no way. Right? Only he was the beneficiary, not me. Right? So how can we win salvation? We can. It's already been wrought out for us in Christ. He's done it. Trying to work our way in is like trying to steal something that we can never steal. It's something that we were given as a gift. Right? If, if Joel said, turns around and says, here, I give it to you. Here, I'm going to give it to you for free. That's the only way I can gain it, right? So covenant between father and son, I can only benefit if I accept what they have done amongst themselves. You see, Simeon and Anna were two great examples for us. You know that? They understood out of so many people in Israel at the time, they, that, those two particular people, they understood, and there was a few others, and anticipated the work of God through Christ. Luke chapter 2, I'm going to now go back to Luke like I said I would, and we're going to be wrapping up here in a minute. We're going to be going from Luke chapter 2, verse 25. We're going to go all the way down to 38. This is going to be our closing scripture text. It's probably like a dozen verses, right? But anyway... That's our closing text. Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 38. Notice what it says. Remember, we're looking at two great examples that we should really admire and seek to also be like. Simeon and Anna. And verse 25 says, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout. Anybody here wants to be just and devout? Waiting for something. Simeon was waiting with longing anticipation for something. Waiting for the consolation of Israel. Who is the consolation of Israel? Jesus Christ. So in other words, he was waiting for Christ. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. So what did the Holy Ghost do? It led him. It said, go to the temple now. Did you know that? The Holy Ghost told him, go now. Go now to the temple. Notice in verse 26. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost. That he should not see death before he had seen the Lord, the Lord's Christ. So, verse 27, here it is, the Holy Spirit tells him. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. Will God guide us if we're sincere, devout? Huh? Here's what I found on the web. Hopefully, we find Jesus, but not on the web. <laughs> <laughs> Siri, did you find Jesus? Uh, she would say no. She would say, no, I don't know who you're talking about. You know their program like that, right? They don't, they don't know. They're like, they, won't, they won't talk about Jesus. You know, he's, he's just a fictional character. Yeah. So anyway, but so he came. He was being led by the Holy Spirit. Where? To the temple. It was the Spirit that said, hey, go now. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, which is baby dedication, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let's... Let your servant depart in peace according to thy word. He had to immediately go over there and say, Oh, let me hold him. Let me touch him. You see that? For my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all the people, even though they're probably home sleeping right now. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled. They're like, whoa. Okay. Praise the Lord. They were probably kind of stunned, right? Well, this is great. They marveled at those things which were spoken by this just man, Simeon. It's like he was prophesying right there before them. It was another confirmation that they were, they were privileged to raise up God. And in verse 34, Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. In other words, many will fall because they reject him. Many will rise because they accept him. 
So he has come to bring that final closure to this great controversy. Those on the right will go to the right. Those on the left will go to the left. There will be a dividing of sheep and goats. Gold and chaff, right? Or what is it? Gold and wheat and chaff and then gold and what was it? Dross. Dross. He has been set up for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. In other words, there's going to be opposition. There's going to be some terrible things that will happen. Get ready. God is warning you just to be ready so that you don't take it and be shocked by what happens. You need to prepare your heart. Stay close to God because you need to. See what God is doing? He sent a messenger to bring Mary advanced information. What does the Bible say in Amos 3.7? The Lord don't allow anything to happen that affects his children unless he reveals those secrets to his servants, the prophets. Amen? Will that happen to us as well? Absolutely. And in verse 35, Yea, a sword shall pierce through your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. That's what Simeon, that was his part to play in this baby dedication ceremony. And then comes Anna into the picture. In verse 36, there was one Anna. She was also had some insight because she was called a prophetess. The daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and lived in, with a husband seven years and then from her virginity and she was a widow for, of about four score and four years which departed not, notice here, which departed not from the temple but served God with fastings and prayer night and day. You think God would reveal things to her? Absolutely. You see her dedication? She was at the temple night and day. It doesn't mean she was living in it. Okay, It means that she was there all the time. She, she, her, her desire was to be among those that were sharing the word or, you know, she wanted to continue to just bask in the word of God. Is that us today? Something to think about. Do we desire to be together with brethren in the temple? In the temple? Anna did. She was considered a prophetess, a righteous, just, virtuous woman, wasn't she? Virtuous widow. And she, so she comes in that instant, I guess when Simeon was already finishing doing his part. She comes in now, and she gives thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So she did the same thing. She went up and said, oh, it's my turn. Let me... And then she went out and she didn't only stay, leave it there. She went and started proclaiming this as well. Brethren, in closing, you see how deep and how significant a baby dedication is. It's not just people, two people coming together to dedicate their child to the Lord. It reminds us of the deliverance that God has done many times in the past. And foreshadowing the greatest deliverance of all. Our deliverance was, was at Calvary. That was the greatest deliverance that he was speaking about. But even another deliverance for us would be to just finally be done with this world. Wouldn't it be? To be in the presence of God finally. Huh? Think about that. As we contemplate what God has taught us today. In what we experience today. Let us go forth like Simeon. Like Anna. To speak of these things and of him of whom all of us are have received redemption. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us have a word of prayer. Amen. Dear loving Father, we just want to thank you so much for what you have revealed to us today. We thank you, Lord, again, for giving us the light on the profound significance of a baby dedication. 
how it brings us back to what Christ did at Calvary. And how he had died and shed his blood to set us free. To offer us, to you even, as a gift. We're told that we are, we are your reward. And so Lord, help us to meditate on these things. And really contemplate these two individuals that we just read about, Simeon and Anna. And how they reacted when they saw Christ being dedicated. And they just saw him and they, they saw their redemption. So let us focus on redemption today. Through this beautiful ceremony that we have experienced. And this message that you have given to us. And help our hearts to be filled with gratitude. As we contemplate that redemption. Lord, continue to be with us. As we go forward today, as we fellowship, as we enjoy the rest of the activities today, continue to be with us and bless us according to your will. Bind our hearts, continue to fill us with understanding and knowledge that it may become power to our souls unto sanctification, that your word would truly have that effect of sanctifying our hearts. For Lord, we give ourselves to you. Just like we dedicated Azrael to you today, we dedicate ourselves to you. So take us, Lord. Do with us what you will. Use us in this great controversy. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And let the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. 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 Don't close that. I'm going to use your call.